name is Katrina Wagner and I am a student growth measure specialist from Southwest Ohio. There are five of us in the state of Ohio. And we're each assigned to a region. At the end of the presentation, you'll get the names and contact information for all of the specialists. This is Carolyn Everidge Fry. She's the assistant director of the Office of Educator Equity and Talent and, and my boss. And she'll be presenting here in just a little bit. We're going to start by, um, I'm going to go over student growth measures and then Carolyn will delve deeper into the SLO process. Just out of curiosity, do we have any race to the top districts in the room? Well, probably all of you should try to race to the top conference maybe. What about TIF, SIG, or SOAR districts? Do we have any of those? Okay. The ORC requires that teacher evaluation be um, split into two parts. 50% of the evaluation must be based on student growth measures. And we're going to talk about all of the different categories for student growth measures. The other 50% is based on those seven um, teaching standards. And many of you have probably been through the three-day OTES training and have been trained or credentialed as an OTES evaluator. So 50% is on those observations and walkthroughs, and the other 50% is on student growth measures. The Ohio Revised Code says that anyone who is employed and working under a teaching license, employed at least 50% of their time, must be evaluated with the OTES model. This is a little bit tricky for, um, for some people. They get confused about this. They say, well, what if, what if my teacher is um, only working four hours a day? Would they have to be evaluated under OTES? What do you guys think? Yes, because, well, it depends. If they come in and they're working four hours and they're spending two hours instructing students, then yes, they would have to be evaluated under OTES. Would a guidance counselor fall under OTES? No. Probably not, because remember, they have to be working under a teaching license and they have to be providing direct instruction to students. And usually guidance counselors are not working under a teaching license and they're supporting students, but they're not providing direct instruction. What about a speech therapist? What do you think? Would they be evaluated under OTES? No, it, Nope, it's really based on their teaching license or certificate. Most speech therapists do not work under a teaching license, so they would not be evaluated under OTES um, if they were working under that teaching license, um, which we have had some instances, but usually that's not the case. What about an intervention specialist? Yes, definitely. Intervention specialists work under a teaching license, and they provide instruction to students, so they would be included. So remember, think about the 50%. They have to spend 50% of their time employed. They have to be working under a teaching license. And they have to be providing instruction. For the purpose in Ohio's evaluation system, student growth is defined as the change in student achievement for an individual between two or more points in time. So we're measuring growth. A lot of people think about this, um, they're thinking about achievement and proficiency. And remember with the OTES model and student growth measures, we're, we're talking about growth and the change in growth between two points in time. Consider a third grade teacher who receives a new student in the fall. Perhaps they're reading on a first grade level. On the OAA, when we think about achievement, that child would be expected to pass the third grade reading assessment and it might not happen if they come in on a first grade level. When we think about growth in SLOs and measuring student growth, the third grade teacher might be able to bring that student from a first grade reading level to a second grade reading level. And in this system, that teacher would get credit for that child if she set her target at a year's growth. We also have to remember though that um, if a teacher only moves the child one year's worth of um, growth over a one-year period, that child will never catch up. So we have to keep that in the back of our mind as we're setting growth targets. Have you seen this slide before? This should look familiar. Remember the left side is that 50% teacher performance on the standards. Those are the formal evaluations and walkthroughs. And the right side is what we're talking about today. 
That's the 50% student growth measures, the, the light purple. Growth measures are broken down into three categories. Category A are teachers who instruct value-added courses. So that's fourth and through eighth grade reading and math. Category B are teachers who um, give an assessment that's on the approved vendor assessment list. That's posted on the ODE website, and it was just updated the 21st of February, and it will be updated annually around that same time. We're going to go into each of these in just a minute. Category C are teachers who have no um, teacher level value added or vendor assessment data. So we're talking about using SLOs for those category C teachers and shared attribution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. And since we're so um, small, if you are confused or have a question, feel free to ask as we go along. With House Bill 555, Category A became um, divided into two categories, A1 and A2. A1 are for those teachers who instruct value-added courses exclusively. So for example, that might be a fourth grade reading teacher. If she teaches reading all day long and doesn't instruct any other courses, she's automatically A1. A2 are those teachers who instruct value-added courses, but not exclusively. So an example might be a fourth grade teacher who instructs reading for part of the day and social studies for part of the day. So she would be considered A2. Is that clear? Good. Timeline for implementation. Most um, race to the top TIF and SIG districts are required to implement um, this upcoming year. Some are already implementing, and what you have to think about is your scope of work. So if you're unsure, check with someone in your district. But um, TIF schools, SIG schools, and Race to the Top schools have scopes of work, and they do indicate when you have to implement. Due to the um, differing legislative effective dates, other districts should seek legal counsel. But most districts are implementing in the upcoming school year. So what do we know? We have three types of measures, category A, B, and C, three categories of teachers. And um, districts have discretion and flexibility because each district has its own unique situation. So we're, we're not telling you what percentages or what, which categories belong into um, which area. That's left up to the district to determine. We're going to look a little bit deeper at each of the three categories. The first one we're going to talk about is teacher value added. Many different statistical models are av available to calculate student growth, and one that Ohio uses is the EVOS model. How many of your districts have went through linkage and, and know what I'm talking about when I talk about value added? Okay. This is something that fourth through eighth grade teachers do um, every spring, and um, district, school, and grade level value added reports become available. And they've been, you know, a lot of districts have used this for a, a long time. Some districts will link for the first time this year. So the value added reports that currently exist are for those fourth through eighth grade reading and math teachers. And there are some reports right now in fifth and eighth grade math. And we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. When um, we start administering the park assessments, we are, are we confident that we will get value added for those, Carolyn? We will, those will replace the OAA um, assessments and we'll have more reports for the varying park assessments that will become available. So for value added, um, if you've been through linkage, you have teacher level reports. So in the past, we've gotten the building and the district level reports. Once you go through the linkage process, you get an actual teacher level report. We're going to have a phase in implementation of math and reading grades four through eight with other grades and subjects coming in the future. So um, right now, that's what everyone's linking is that math and reading. Yes? The value added reports that the teachers got received had five categories as opposed to the three that are in the growth. Can you please speak to that? The teacher level value added reports do have five different categories, five, four, three, two, and one. 
Um, five is, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but that's above expected growth. Four, three, and two are collapsed into met expected growth, and then one is below expected growth. We have a lot of districts who already get teacher level reports, and they'll ask, do I have to use my rolling average, or can I just use this year's um, report? And the answer to that is you do have to use your composite rolling average. And it looks like we only have one district who is linked, so some of you are probably thinking I'm speaking a foreign language right now, but when you start getting those teacher level reports, your initial report will just have you know, this year's data, and the next year you'll have two years worth of data, and then it, it, every three years it um, renews. Okay, so in 2013-14, House Bill 555 said we had to use value-added. So if a teacher instructs a value-added course, they do have to use that value-added report in some manner. Um, for Category A1, and remember, those are the teachers who exclusively teach value-added courses. The phase and period is that beginning in 2013-14, they have to use a majority of their teacher level value added report and their student growth. So that's 26% or more. Beginning in 2014-15, House Bill 555 indicates that they have to use that teacher level value added report at the full 50%. Category A2, those are those teachers who instruct value added but not exclusively. So the example was a fourth grade reading teacher who also instructs social studies. House Bill 555 says that they have to use that teacher level value added report in proportion to their schedule. So in the situation that I give, if I'm teaching reading half the day and social studies half the day, out of my 50%, I might do 25% value added and the other 25% might be a local measure. The minimum usage for value added for those A1 teacher or A2 teachers is 10%. Roster verification process. Have, are any of you attending or have attended a linkage or a roster verification or value added um, session today? Okay. The roster verification process is a process that teachers, um, they log in and they verify that they are teaching the students who are on their roster and they're attributing instructional learning to, uh, to a number. So they might say, well, I teach um, this entire group 100% of the time for math. Or I co-teach, so I teach this entire course um, at 50% and my instructional aide or instructional specialist um, teaches the other 50% of the time. Right now, Battelle for Kids is offering linkage training and linkage occurs in April. So everyone's linking this year and you'll be going through this process with your fourth through eighth grade reading and math teachers. So if it's something you'd like to learn more about, there are additional sessions offered today and the Battelle for Kids website, and we're gonna have that up here for you in just a moment, has a wealth of information as well. And here it is, I always get ahead of myself, yes. Has ODE, have, um, have they created a model of percentages that you should we do have some business rules that are in the process of being published um, that address some of those issues and Carolyn when do you think those might be published I would hope no later than the middle of April if not sooner what is that what they'll be? Either there or the district resource link, maybe. Right. And they don't give you um, direct answers as far as co-teaching. They don't say in the co-teaching situation, you should split it 50-50. Um, they do give you some guidance, oh, what I do, um, as to things to consider as you're making those decisions. But ultimately, it's up to the district to make those determinations. Um, there are value added leaders in your region, usually at the ESC level, who have been trained to provide value added training for your districts, and they're a good resource. I know there are quite a few across the regions. There are online courses on the Battelle for Learning website that are free that you can log into and enroll in learning and uh, go through those courses. There are webinars, and once again, um, if you go into STARS, you can look for upcoming Battelle for Kids trainings. And there's the website there at the bottom. 
um, Carolyn indicated that this will be available to download this PowerPoint um, somewhere. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, category B, remember, are the approved vendor assessments. And a lot of people give vendor assessments and they say, well, I'm giving this vendor assessment so they're category B. Um, the vendor assessment that you're utilizing has to be on the ODE approved vendor assessment list in order for that teacher to be considered category B. That doesn't mean you can't use other vendor assessments, it just means that those will be used as part of your SLO process and we'll talk more about that later. I have a question. Yeah. If Mm -hmm. Do you have to use it, or are you in that category automatically, or can you just write SLOs that vendor assessment? For example, we use A11 mm -hmm. first grade, and we use it more to determine who needs more intense intervention. If you're giving the assessment in the manner the vendor intends in order to produce a growth report, you have to use that growth um, as a category B measure. You need to check with the vendor to determine whether or not you're following their guidelines in order to receive a growth report. If you are, you're automatically category B and have to use that at a minimum of 10%. If you're not following their guidelines for um, administration, then you could build that into part of your SLO as the assessment or not use it at all. Okay. To become um, to be on the vendor approved list or approved vendor list, Carolyn always gets on me because I flip those words. The vendors have to demonstrate that they um, could produce a growth report and that they could also produce that one, two, three, four, five rating, just similar to the value added rating. There are two distinct vendor lists on the posted document. So um, when you're looking at that, it's posted on the SGM page. And um, the first couple pages kind of discuss how the RFQ process works. Then there are the list of approved vendors. And I, I get a lot of questions about the vendors. ODE doesn't provide guidance um, about particular vendors. So you should always contact the vendor if you have questions. But on that approved vendor um, assessment list, you'll be able to click the service summary. And it'll pull up the information and the contact number for the people you need to contact if you have a question. Every year we go through an RFQ process and um, vendors are added to the list. So in December that window will open again and uh, vendors will have the opportunity to become a part of that list if they meet the requirements. Okay. This is just a slide that talks about um, category B and for category A1 teachers. Remember those are those teachers who instruct value added exclusively. Because of the phase-in period with House Bill 555, we could use a vendor assessment with those teachers just for the 2013-14 school year. But remember, in 14-15, it's not applicable because we have to use the full 50%. For A2, that's a district decision. And what happens is um, that gets entered under as a local measure. And Carolyn will talk about the ET PEST system and some other things here in a little bit. Um, and remember, as we said before, if you're using a Category B approved vendor assessment, it has to be used at a minimum of 